Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 155, a continuation of our single word vlog series. Who knew this was a thing? And our single word this week has a slash in it. Ooh, trendy. Disability. Disability. And we've had some requests for this one. Some of you may remember I did a social justice series of vlogs. And at the conclusion of that series, I received an email from one of our students at Flinders University who asked to remain anonymous, and that's absolutely fantastic. But she expressed in her email the casual nature of ableism, the casual nature of discrimination, the the slights, the ridicule, the embarrassment on a day-to-day -day basis and how rarely it's acknowledged or discussed or talked about. So I thank you for that incredibly moving email and this vlog is in respect and response of your life, your career and your courage. But also I received a fantastic message from the wonderful Alex. Hello Alex. Alex has dyspraxia and he has dyslexia and he wrote me an email asking, you know, knowing I have an impairment myself, how I've gained success but also how to connect in and with a graduate program. So he's had success at undergraduate level, success at a coursework master's level and wanted some strategies to enable success in and through a doctorate. So my absolute pleasure to provide that information for you, Alex, you rule. And I want to dedicate the vlog this week to my mate, Daryl. Daryl is about to finish his PhD. Daryl, you are a leader. Daryl, I learn from you every day. This one is for you, brother. And I wanted to start the vlog this week with a story. I'm not really a storyteller, but this story perhaps tells us something, I think, about disability and ability in our universities, how we find the ability in the disability, and also how easy it is to manage modifications and create a socially just environment. So let me tell you about uh, my last job. Early in my second week as the head of school of education, teacher education at Charles Sturt University, I was having to make some decisions. Now it's always very challenging the first month in a new job because everyone's looking at the new head of school and it's like what's going on here and you are actually establishing a new culture. So it's quite a stressful time. And I was organising all the new committee structures. Now committees in universities are deeply problematic and I have particular attitudes about them. They need to be short, they need to be sharp, they need to be focused. So I was organising the meetings for the entire year. And while this was occurring in the second week, one of my wonderful administrative officers, Julianne, hello Julianne, uh, came into my office, poked her head in my office actually and said, look, Tara, we've got a bit of a problem because she was scheduling rooms for this new committee structure and there was one participant who was managing a chronic long-term illness that resulted in medication being taken and a series of mobility impairments. So because of her issues, because of the medication she was taking to manage it, she was facing an array of physical and emotional challenges that sort of manifested or a proxy for. She had challenges getting up a set of stairs. So my wonderful administrative assistant said, Tara, um, at the moment, the meeting that she's in <laughs> is programmed for a first story meeting room in a building without a lift. And she said, what should I do? And I said, well, obviously, reorganize the meeting in a ground floor room. She said, absolutely fine, that's great. I said, does this particular woman require specialist seating? Yes, she does. So I said, right, what I want you to do for me is in my calendar before this meeting, at quarter two, I want a notification to me to go down to that room and put in this specific seating so the staff member can arrive, no stress, no worries, and sit down and commence the meeting, so her life is streamlined and cool. I mean, how hard is this? Rebook a meeting room and organize a chair, right? This is not hard stuff. So I'd assumed that that particular problem had been resolved and like I had a school, I just simply went on to the next problem, the next issue, the next email. What I wasn't expecting was an incredibly inspirational and moving email from that particular staff member. 
uh, I remember it to this day, I was absolutely in tears at the end of it because she was just so grateful and I felt so incredibly guilty and sad that that something so small became so big for this person and that she was having to be thankful for someone organising a chair and organising a room for her. It was just bizarre. And I raised the question with my administrative staff at the time, surely anybody would be doing a modification like this for a colleague. This is straightforward stuff. And I raised the question, why was the meeting booked in this upstairs room in the first place, knowing that our colleague has mobility challenges? And it later became clear that the chair of this particular meeting intentionally asked for that first floor meeting room to ensure that the woman would quote unquote wake up to herself and experience the shame, the guilt, the ridicule and the embarrassment. And if you think this is not about PhD students, this same senior staff member, she was a professor, later said, while well, I was at head of school, so this was during my term, later said in response to a PhD student, when I said, look, I've got a PhD student that's raising some concerns, and she replied via email, oh God, is he complaining about his disability again? End of quote. So as you can see, blame, shame, discrimination, cruelty. This is a micro narrative that's been cut from the fabric of the daily life of our universities involving academic staff. So we see lots of problems here. Willful discrimination, certainly, an active desire to hurt, but also the incredible ease with which these problems can be resolved. So the question in the vlog this week is how we resolve these problems, yes, but how we actually stop them emerging in the first place and particularly how we try to structurally stop individuals like this bringing shame onto students and colleagues with an impairment, with a disability. So how do we create a welcoming, open, enabling university, and indeed a welcoming, open, enabling doctoral program? So to enact such a, a project, which I call the Enabling Universities Project, and of course I wrote a book on this a few years ago called Enabling Universities. It's done very well. I'm very proud of that book. It really was an intervention, I think, so I'm proud of that from Springer. Uh, but what I realise is to create this Enabling Universities Project, it is interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, perhaps post-disciplinary, and it requires a series of knowledge systems from media management to mobility studies to cultural geography to internet studies to to design studies, but also in and through disability studies. And therefore, what I want today is a direct conversation with you, our wonderful students at Flinders University and our wonderful students who watch this around the world. You are our future. So when you are a supervisor, when you are a, an academic, when you are a Dean of Graduate Research, have a think about what I'm talking about today and how you, yes you, through your actions, through your beliefs, you can change somebody's life and you can improve our universities. Okay, so what I would always say is this enabling universities maxim, if you will, commences with a single truth. And that is you, that is the staff members, the students, the citizens with a disability, you are experts in your own life. Full stop. Therefore, an enabling university must leave spaces in the weave of learning to hear you, to hear your stories and enable your progress. So we also need to create places and locations where you can stand or sit wonderfully in a wheelchair, but occupy a position and speak your truth. And that therefore will intervene in our assumptions, our social practices, in higher education. Now, the International Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was ratified, is today ratified by a hundred nations, and that emerged, was released in the year 2006, and inclusive education was part of its mandate. But I always worry about the phrase inclusive education, I worry about the phrase special education too, and I'll tell you why. I become very frustrated and very worried that the lives and the motivations and the expectations of men and women with disabilities, that they're capped with the phrase inclusive education. I'll explain why. Because, right, inclusive education, what does that actually mean? 
Does that mean, all oh, right, well, if a person with a disability finishes high school, or a person with a disability finishes their undergraduate degree, that our business is concluded. So society's job is done at that point. So are we, as the ableist argument goes, simply discharging our duty towards the disabled, us, them, uh, if they finish high school, if they do a degree. Now this is an ableist notion because you're seeing the disability, you're not seeing the person. But secondly, it's assuming that the person with an impairment is secondary has a deficit, it's just not quite good enough. And you know what? That's nonsense. A brilliant person should be able to complete a PhD and have the goal, have the aspiration, have the motivation, but also have the pathway. Rather than assuming, all oh, right, well, that person over there has a disability and therefore, you know, they might do an undergraduate degree and that's fine, but we'll cap their motivations, we'll cap their hopes. And what about the PhD? Well, I want our doctoral programs to capture the diversity of what our population is and can be. I want an enabling doctoral program that takes the best and the brightest from our undergraduate programs, whatever their ability or disability may be. Now, this is not happening. And it's not happening because of invisibility. So postgraduate students in our universities are pretty well invisible. And can I say the invisibility in Australia specifically is debilitating and stunning. And can I say the problem as a dean is it's very difficult to create policies or procedures or guidelines for a group that is invisible. What happens therefore in this space through that invisibility is we study them. You can see the objectification occurring here. They are the objects of our research. They're not the scholar, they're not the student, they're not the academic. Instead, they're simply the group over there that we study. So objectification creates oppression. And let's stop this. Let's you and I make a decision to create change today. Now, just to explain the scale and scope of what we're dealing with here, so about 18.5%, 18.5% of the Australian population have an impairment or a disability, but 35.9% of Australian households in case somebody with a disability. And can I say, really, in Australia, we need to hang our heads in shame. This is an absolute disgrace. When I was gathering the most up-to-date data set for the vlog today, I was horrified, absolutely disgusted, to be frank with you. The Centre of Research in Excellence for Disability and Health uh, released their study in 2017. And they showed through all the traditional indicators of health, Australians with disabilities are faring particularly badly when matched against international comparisons. So Australians with disabilities have the lowest relative income and one of the lowest levels of labour force participation in the OECD. Wow. So Australians with a disability, the problem gets worse, are uh, more likely to be unemployed, uh, more likely to be in inadequate and unsustainable housing structures, not completed their schooling in profound poverty. So these variables all come together to create profound and structural health problems. Now you might say quite rightly, well Tara, considering the scale of that injustice, an enabling university program, let alone an, an enabling doctoral program, is the least of our worries in contemporary Australia. Sorry to be all Fabian about it. Can I say I love the Fabians, big fan of the Fabians, but there needs to be an intervention team. And the question is culturally how we create that intervention. And the Fabians always argue that the most important intervention is in and through education. The single strategy through history that has enabled disempowered groups, whether it be citizens of colour, indigenous peoples, women, the working class, has been more universal education. 
So every student that graduates from a PhD program and that person has a disability or an impairment is a beacon, yes, but they're also a teacher, they're also a learner, they're also a researcher. And most importantly, if we learn their lessons, we can improve our systems, improve our structures for the next generation, for the next cohort of students, and show the world. And I don't, I'm not a big fan of the mentoring and role modeling stuff, you know that. But we need to show that there is a strategy, there is a pathway, that we diagnose what's going wrong and we fix it. That's important. What we're trying to do is create choices in housing, in employment, in education, and yes, in health. As my old mother used to say, education creates choices. Education creates choices. So what's happening in our universities? Well, let's drill right into this because this is a contemporary big issue. So Universities Australia reported in 2018, that is last year, I'm recording this in March of 2019, they reported a doubling of Australian undergraduates with an impairment between 2006 and 2017. So that doubling moved from 25,000 people to 50,000 people with an impairment, a disability in undergraduate programs. So you might rightly say that's absolutely fantastic, Tara. That's improvement. That's remarkable. A doubling in 11 years. That's terrific. And look, you are right. That's great. But I'll give you one more data point. There are 1.5 million domestic and international students enrolled in Australian universities. So we've got 50,000 students with a disability of the 1.5 million students enrolled. And also research is showing a lot is going wrong in undergraduate education as well. There was a great article published by Sue Kirkpatrick et al last year titled Exploring the Retention and Success of Students with a Disability. And she showed that while the number of students with a disability is certainly increasing in our undergraduate programs, the retention rate is lower than the able-bodied population. I hate that phrase, but you see what I'm saying. So the comparison and also the completion rate for each individual course is of a lower order. So something seriously is going wrong here. There are many reasons for this attrition rate, certainly, but the key one, I think, is a lack of commitment to universal design and universal access. So once more, and this has been a recurrent trope through all these vlogs, we see a confusion of standards, which is absolutely crucial, standards with standardisation. We have more interesting and innovative theories of teaching and learning right now than at any point in the history of education. The multimodality theories, information literacy theories, it because of the overwhelming majority of academics ha do not hold an impairment or a disability. None of their peers hold a disability. None of their students hold a disability. You can see what's happened here. So that means because of a lack of experience in teaching and learning through multimodal environments to enable disability because a lack of experience there we've got academics who are teaching as they were taught or indeed even more worryingly teaching as they think they were taught so instead of they could be creating a diverse information scaffold to enable diverse learning outcomes we've got this Fordist education that is still dominating you see it's never been easier to create a post-Fordist, customised, bespoke learning journey through a degree. Never been easier. And yet, what are we doing? Well, we're using pretty poor learning management systems and we're letting the technology determine our andragogy instead of making the technology serve our learning outcomes. We've got it backwards. So unimaginative assessment tools, recycling the same old assessment items year after year rather than actually thinking about multimodality and transforming how we engage with learning outcomes, backward mapping to assessment. We've got other problems. We've got a casualised workforce and of course wonderful men and women are part of that casualised workforce but they're paid by the hour so it means Unlike in the old days, they're not sitting in their office for a working day for a student to just pop in and get some advice, right? So that's, again, a lack of flexibility in teaching and learning. 
And also there is another cause of this problem and that is complete invisibility of men and women with an impairment. Because the numbers are so low, it's not seen to be a problem because it is invisible. And it's invisible because there are so few academics with a disability. Now, I've yet to find a single proper demographic study of academics in Australian universities. So the invisibility is so bad, we can't even find a reporting structure. This is astounding to me. But what I did find in preparation for the vlog this week is an article by Joseph Gridgley in June 2017 and he reported this issue in the United States and I think his title is incredibly important quote the neglected demographic end of quote what a great title the neglected demographic so Gridgley like me was absolutely stunned uh, at the lack of publishing and publication and research on this topic and it was only after a freedom of information request at the University of California, Berkeley, that the scale and scope of this invisibility became clear. Hang on to yourself, here we go. Of the 1,522 academics at the University of California, Berkeley, 1.5% of those academics had a disability. Now that was surprising. The National Center for College Students with Disabilities, again in the United States, had estimated about 4% of college academics, college professors, hold an impairment or disability. But they acknowledged in their data set that was an estimate. We can see by the Freedom of Information request, actually that estimate was way too high at 4%. Now in the US once more, if we go to the NPSAS data, and what that is, is that's the funding mechanism for students, particularly students with a disability. So that's probably a pretty accurate data set because a student has to declare a disability to receive funding, right? So in this particular organization, 8% of master's students declare a disability, 7% of doctoral students declare a disability. Okay, so we've got some data points here. So let's generalize this a bit. The higher the level of education, the less likely a person is to have a disability. This means that when academics are considering teaching and learning, they're thinking about research policies and research trajectories, disability is not even in their minds. They don't have one, none of their colleagues have one, their students don't have one. Okay, so this issue is completely invisible. So when the issue is raised at undergraduate level, now that we are seeing some undergraduate uh, students with impairments in our programs, the language that's used is significant, guys. It's a disability action plan, and it's about reasonable modifications, okay? So this is the sort of language that's being used. And for all of these disability action plans to be activated, a student has to declare that they are disabled. So they can't be private in with their impairment. They have to declare to get modifications. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative clearly is universal design. Reconfiguring a PhD from the ground up as a universal design project. So let me show you how this works. The PhD is simply a standard, a standard of achievement. How you get there, multiple pathways can get you there. But it does require a supervisor and a student to be clear and precise and enable progress. A supervisor, therefore, supervision, supervision, is required to create that information scaffold to move a student from dependence to independence, from synthesizing knowledge to an original contribution to knowledge. Now, those pathways are punctuated by milestones. By the way, that's the reason at Flinders we put in milestones. So they're where you're meant to be. That's orienting all sorts of students through all sorts of pathways. Take whatever way you like. 
but that's the milestone any way you like that's the milestone that's universal design and design strategies and of course diverse media can be deployed to activate and show right I have reached that milestone with considered use of interfaces so some students might be very comfortable and able to deliver a seminar in an actual location other students might be more comfortable doing a podcast where they can actually control it but all sorts of ways to communicate research through multimodal theories can show that that student can disseminate research. So there's lots of ways in and through the milestone. So when we think through these types of permutations and options, we are reaching the same outcomes and the same standards, just in different ways. And Justin Powell described this as the quote, universal design university, end of quote. What a great phrase. So we start by thinking through open and accessible architecture, but this, of course, must include deep training of teachers, deep training of supervisors, so they're aware of the interfaces that are available, the information scaffolding strategies, and backward mapping for men and women with impairments. Now, the reason that all of this stuff is very rarely considered, and might be the first time you're thinking about it, is because the overwhelming majority of academics don't have an impairment, and most of their friends don't have an impairment and most of their students don't have an impairment. So a problem is only a problem if it's visible. <laughs> so at the moment the issue of disability is a weeping wound just at the edge of our campuses and we're not looking up and seeing it. Now I care about this issue for many reasons. Firstly, I work in the media. I'm formerly a professor of media, formerly a professor of communication, formerly a professor of cultural studies, currently a professor of cultural studies. And that means my expertise, my actual content expertise, is understanding media and open access and open design and multimodality. This is my business. So there's never been a more interesting time to think about digitization and social media and disintermediation. It's a fascinating time. It's never been easier to create alternative pathways through the media to enable progress. Okay. But also, secondly, guys, I'm a trained teacher. I have my degrees in my conventional discipline, so my first discipline was history. I have an array of interdisciplinary qualifications that I built on top of that, but then I do have that third stream where I made a commitment to then do a Bachelor of Education and then do a Research Masters in Education. Okay, Now I did that because this is an area of expertise. My other degrees had no consciousness of awareness of teaching and learning, so therefore it was important to do those qualifications. And indeed, in the first year of my Bachelor of Education, there was an amazing subject on disability, and that changed and rocked my world. But thirdly also, I've supervised an array of students with an impairment or a disability through my career. About a third of my students have had an impairment. Can I say that proportion is increasing radically in size these days. So as a teacher, as a supervisor, my job is to think about how to get this remarkable group of people with diverse needs and interests through to the standards of a PhD. That's the daily business. And finally, of course, as some of you may know, I'm one of those few academics that actually has a disability, has an impairment. Indeed, that's why the wonderful Alex emailed me because I have dyspraxia and, and he has dyspraxia and he wants to find strategies that I've used that have worked for me uh, to enable his progress. And I'll give you, Alex, a couple of clear suggestions in a sec. And by the way, for those of you that sort of what the hell is dyspraxia, uh, in the 70s, this was known as clumsy child syndrome. It's sometimes referred to as developmental coordination disorder, DCD, but that's a bit different from dyspraxia. But basically, all of these terms are linked together where a bunch of people have no real consciousness or awareness of their limbs in space. So it means there's some issues with the motor coordination skills, okay? Not terribly rare, about four in a hundred people have it, and it's more boys than girls, more men than women. 
So I was really fortunate, and I, I treat dyspraxia, to be frank, as a gift. It is a superpower. But I was very fortunate because the man who became the world expert in clumsy child syndrome was named Dr. Sonny Gabe. And unbelievably, he was living in Perth in Western Australia when he was doing this research. So in these early published studies in the late 70s, I'm one of the little girls in the study. So it's absolutely fantastic. And so I benefited from that research about the importance of early intervention in occupational therapy. So I was part of all that. Big respect to all our Occy therapy guys and gals. You are wonderful. But also I had really stroppy parents. I know that will come as a surprise to you that really, really pushed me. And so I was playing piano and playing guitar motor coordination, uh, at five years of age. Uh, they made me do dancing. Can you imagine, darlings? And also, quite fantastically, they made me learn to type very early. And my mother's often said, I know you've achieved all these awards and degrees and things, but my proudest moment was when you got the Year 10 Typing Prize. Thank you, Doris. So you can see, you know, there are enabling strategies. But also, you know, I was bullied dreadfully at school. Young girls are dreadful, aren't they? And, you know, I have profound memories of these young girls following me round the schoolyard chanting, disabled are able. Some of you may remember that ad. Chanting disabled are able around the schoolyard, okay? So, and because I, I walked a bit oddly and I maybe looked a bit different where well, my heart bleeds. And look, to this day, you, you can see it every now and again, I still have to take stairs very, very carefully. I hold on to the railing every single time. And escalators are a bit of a challenge to me. When I'm tired and I've got lots of bags and things, I do find myself every now and again, it does make me laugh, sort of staring at the escalator going, I've got no actual idea how to get on this thing. Wow, okay. So, but you know, tiredness does that. Not quite sure again how I'm holding bags and stuff. And look, it takes me a bit longer to get to places than most people. But I'm really lucky and I think dyspraxia gives gifts to those of us that it touches. And I'm also fortunate because my fantastic staff at Flinders University are absolutely Fabulous. So all they simply do is they book a little bit more time for me to walk to meetings, particularly if stairs are involved. My staff members, when they're with me, make sure without anybody else knowing, I know Karen, without anyone else knowing, I'm positioned next to the railing so no one knows that I need that to get up and down the stairs. It's fantastic. And laughingly, my staff refer to my inability to move beyond about 15 streets in Adelaide as the Brabber Zone. Oh, look, that meeting, we better take Tara to that meeting because it's outside of the Brabber Zone. Fantastic stuff. So as you can see, absolutely terrific. Universal design in work and in life. So they've got a good clear sense of this is what their dean can do, this is what takes a little bit longer for the dean to do, and this is the dean's <laughs> superpower. So I'm hypersensate, I've got a very good sense of my senses, and I have a very good memory because I've had to develop one. So they're very aware of the strengths, the challenges, and the things I do really, really well. And now, of course, I've just returned last week from a trip to Macau. And you can imagine, I, I, you know, I've flown on my own since I was 20 years of age, but you can imagine, like, airports are a dyspraxic's worst nightmare, right? Because there's all sorts of barriers and things. And it's like, what is going on here? And look, I come back, as you can see, bruised, marked, grazes. I have no idea. I've got all these scratches. It's just fantastic. But look, it is a triumph. And even the most complex trips... I break down into its segments or its parts. I print out maps of airports. I use my visual literacy to lead my motor or corporeal literacy. So I gain visual literacy in the logistics of place, and that makes a real difference. So Alex, all I'd say to you, mate, is if you want a career of success, I only have two tricks, and they have, they've done me pretty well, to be frank with you, and that is I hyper- pattern my day. So I have a very, very clear routine and I have a pattern and I follow that pattern every single day. So the pattern means you know what you're doing, the motor skills relax, everything's cool because you know what's going to happen on a given day. But secondly, so it's pattern, the second strategy is planning. So when you have to break the pattern, Spend some time and do the planning first. Print out the documents, have a look at it, take a breath, have a sense of where you're going, and give yourself plenty of time. So plan, 
the break in the pattern. And that is a strategy for success. So yes, I am a dean with dyspraxia. And that means, therefore, when I write policies or procedures or guidelines, I always have that moment of pause where I think about, now, am I writing in a barrier here? Have I got an assumption that's blocking people coming into this program or doing this task in a diversity of ways? And that's when I have a pause, have a think, and try and remove the barrier if I can right at the start. That's universal design. But I'm also a supervisor with dyspraxia, and it's no surprise <coughs> excuse me, that I've had a lot of success with students with impairments because I know the questions to ask, I know the strategies that work, and we deploy an array of media options to enable success. And to give you an example of this, I'm going to summon my wonderful former PhD student and a dear friend of mine, Associate Professor, proud of you Mike, Associate Professor Mike Kent. Mike is currently the head of the School of Media, Creative Arts and Social Inquiry at Curtin University. I'm so proud I could just burst. But like the best of students, I learned a great deal from Mike. And he came to me after a failed earlier attempt at another university to do a PhD. And he came to me and said, I want another go. Mike has dyslexia, which is why I was so taken by your email, Alex. And Mike, to enable his success, has, had chosen probably the most complicated PhD you could ever do. So he was using high theory from post-colonial theorizing, homi baba, so looking at colonial theory, post-colonial theory, and applying it to our understanding of the internet. Can you imagine? And the history of the internet. So incredibly difficult. Talk about standards. A thesis doesn't get any harder than that. But what we needed to do was find a way to reach those standards. And so we did it together because he is an expert in his own life and his own learning. So what we decided to do was Mike and I had an hour long meeting each week, sometimes two hours, and he would record those meetings. And what he would do during the week is he would re-listen to our meeting that we would talk through the argument. Here's a chapter, here's a section of the chapter. Let's talk through the argument. Use this theorist, use this theorist, think about these examples. And so he would allow the sound to lead or scaffold his writing. This was brilliant and I loved every single minute of supervising him. He changed me as a supervisor and he finished this remarkable thesis in just over two years. And that's because we used multimodality. We thought actively about interfaces. So Alex, there's probably even more options for you now. Um, I'm about to supervise another student with dyspraxia, so I'm looking at the current opportunities that are available, but there's a lot more sonic scaffolding that's available for you now. Much better screen readers. We can play a lot more with different color blues of screens and paper. And also, of course, the, the dyslexia font looks an absolute ripper to me. So that's a solution for you as well. We've got one more example that I'll share with you. And of course, this is a Flinders example. We think about the wonderful Dr. Vicky Pascoe. Hi, Vicky, you rock. And Vicky appeared in one of our earlier vlogs. Very, very inspirational woman, inspirational vlog. And her physical impairments meant that she had to work in short, sharp bursts. So half an hour and then get up and move for half an hour or an hour. So that was how we had, had to supervise. And the challenge is she'd been enrolled for eight years, over eight years, and had gone through, I think, eight supervisors before Steve and I took on the wonderful Vicky. Now, and she finished in six months. <laughs> now, that's not necessarily a story about great supervision. Maybe a bit of it is, and that's why I'll just share this for the supervisors who are watching this. So, of course, I'm an expert in teaching and learning models. So I thought, right, well, what do we do? How do we scaffold this to make sure it's almost like high intensity interval training for a student? So how do we really cleave out those 30 minutes and make them meaningful? So Steve would then come in and we would both read the work each week and I would find a gap. And what Steve would do would say, right, there's that gap. Now, here's five jobs for her to do in that 30 minutes that fills that gap. So the advice we gave her each week was, say, Vicky, on the top of page 22, you're lacking information about these three issues. Here's a scholar. Can you add three to four paragraphs right there? So we'd be very precise about how those 
30 minutes could be used for her. And together we created a lot of magic. It was one of the most beautiful uh, supervisory experiences I ever had. And Vicky and Steve absolutely loved each other. And it's, you know, Vicky produced a wonderful book and dedicated it to Steve. So it's, it's, a, it's a great story about lots of problems in the past in supervision. And if you get the matrix right, quick achievement. So this is the enabling university, this is the enabling doctorate. We have to recognise the expertise and intelligence of all our students and recognise that expertise and intelligence exists in many different packages and many different forms. So we need to do three things today. I wanted to finish this vlog with what can we do today? And three things. I want an intervention, I want an inventory and I want a revisioning. So let's do this. We need to change this situation. Business as usual is not an option, so we need to therefore intervene with a moment of consciousness, which is what this vlog is, for men and women who teach, who research, who supervise. I understand the intense financial pressure on universities around the world right now, and look, lots of issues are involved and I really get that. And an invisible issue might not be a financial priority, but I think this matters a great deal because at the moment we've got a problem that's invisible. It doesn't have a node or a focus at all. Our students with impairments are not present in our classroom, are not present in our doctoral programs. There's no group to lobby a vice chancellor and say, let's do this better. So therefore this vlog today asks that our leaders in higher education around the world just open their eyes and just try and make our systems and our structures and our policies more robust and more open. To quote Wayne's World 2, the font of all knowledge clearly, book them and they will come. If we describe an enabling university, an enabling doctoral program, and have the systems in place to enable all sorts of students, our students will appear. Can I say I receive more emails from students around the world with an impairment asking me how to do a PhD than on any other issue? The students are here. They are here. We are here. And they are ready to come into our programs. We just need to create a program that is worthy of them. So we need to therefore create that intervention. We also need an inventory, if you will, a cultural map of our online and offline infrastructure, our online and offline legacy architecture. We have to look at, can we make modifications? Can we retrofit these older structures to facilitate the intellectual and the physical movements of our students? The key important variable is every new building Every new website that we create must abide by the principles of universal design. That's the goal. And this final imperative is to create a revisioning. I've dedicated my entire adult and professional and academic life to the revisioning of higher education, to give us a purpose, to give us a goal. When we review the statistics and the tables of the low participation of men and women with impairments in undergraduate qualifications, we've got some very serious problems we have to address. And they're not of our making a lot of the time. Because we would like to select the best and brightest students and allow them to come into our universities. But not only have our universities failed to do that, but our schools have failed and they are failing. So those of us who have dedicated our lives to higher education have failed. And we need to look in the mirror and we need to claim that. We need to own that. And with all the talk of widening participation agendas, which I believe in, first and family, I'm first and family, I get all of this, indigenous students, students of color, women, incredibly important. But the deep structural oppression remains for men and women with an impairment. They are, and we've got a problem, we've got a serious problem in universities because these men and women, young men and women, boys and girls, are oppressed, they're bullied, they're discriminated against in schools. So they're suffering emotional and sometimes physical abuse and they've got limited opportunities to excel or even enjoy their learning in a school environment. So we in universities can demand more of our schools, demand more of teaching and learning. I'll tell you how we do that. 
we focus on teacher education programs. We need to make sure, and by the way, that's why I decided when I returned to Australia to be a professor of education and the head of school of teacher education. There was a method to my madness. Because if we're going to change schools at universities, we need to change teacher education programs, how the teachers are trained to ensure that not only that they're well qualified and knowledgeable about the new theories and practices of universal design and multimodality and information literacy, but that we have men and women who have an impairment and they are able to enrol in teacher education programs. So for, the, for us in higher education, we firstly need to place all our attention on the education degrees. And for the wonderful, extraordinary group of people, hi, who are doing a doctorate, either a doctorate of education, our prof doc, or a PhD in education, you really matter. To this conversation. You are the pivot, you are the interface to revision what we do. But the problem we've got is currently and extraordinarily the students that enrol in teacher education programs they have an even lower level of impairment than the rest of our university degrees. So we just need to snap out of it and recognize questions of disability and impairment don't happen to other people over there. They happen to us. And remember, there is an increasing rate of disability as we get older. So our present is not our future. So a proactive policy is crucial to the future development of our universities. To use one national example, we know just about 18.5% of Australians have a disability. Now the majority of those Australians have a physical impairment. It must be muscular, can be skeletal, can be neurological disorders. Over 700,000 Australians have a developmental impairment. 300,000 Australians have a visual impairment. 20,000 Australians are blind. One in six Australians are impacted by hearing loss. And 90,000 Australians are impacted by mental health concerns. These are not small numbers and every one of those numbers involves a person and a family and a community. So business as usual is not an option. Change is required. The wonderful Michael Oliver, fantastically controversial and provocative scholar, once stated that, quote, a non-walker can make a significant contribution to our understanding of walking. End of quote. How fantastic is that? And of course, that's the point. Men and women with an impairment outside of a university can make an incredible intervention and transformation for what we do in a university to enable the pathway. But we have to listen and we have to learn. If we do not, then this issue is going to remain invisible. And so all of you will graduate from a PhD program. Many of you will become an academic. You will supervise. You too will never supervise a student with an impairment. And as I always say, we do not know what we do not know. So you know what? Know, understand, interpret, find. It is time, it is so time that we understand and we transform our understandings of learning, supervision, and indeed, excellence. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.